they keep so in the past, if that's okay, uh, we, 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 we would try to, to have people stop you ask questions. Would you be okay with I, that so that I'm we make it interactive? That. Can I ask that? Sometimes I don't keep track of raising hands and the chat. So maybe if uh, we'll do. or Clarice, one yeah. of you could you know have a look and just stop, interrupt me to take the question. That yes, uh, we'll do. And, and sometimes we just ask people to unmute themselves and, and, and just ask as, as if we were in a classroom. Right. All right. Cool. Great. But we'll so, yeah. It's an interesting topic today that, you know, we're talking about my favorite qubit as being NMR. I actually don't think of NMR as being a viable qubit. So even though I've, sp I've spent many, many years studying NMR and studying nucleus spins and quantum information processing, I think of it as a useful resource. And it's something that you have to, you're, you're always using sometimes as, as sometimes as a resource, sometimes it's an annoyance but you need to know how to control them and use them. But I usually don't think so much about encoding information into them on uh, when I think about the future of uh, quantum computing. So just something to think about as we move on. And I'm happy to talk more about that uh, as we get towards the end of this. But just to give you a sense of, uh, you know, whoops, here we go. Uh, you know, NMR comes from the basic principle of what's called spin angular momentum. The particles have uh, this property, quantum mechanical property called spin. And so protons, neutrons, electrons are all spin half particles, which essentially means they have two distinct energy levels that, are, uh, that we can use. And that happens to when you have a spin half particle or two level system, you can map it onto a qubit. Now, it turns out that only some nuclear isotopes have non-zero spin, and some of the favorite ones we use in NMR are the proton, which is hydrogen nucleus, carbon-13, which is really nice because it's a spin-half system, but really it's only present in 1% natural abundance in, of all carbon, uh, is carbon-13. Everything else is carbon-12, which has no spin in it. And then there's nitrogen, fluorine, phosphorus, xenon. Now, organic, for organic systems, things like protons, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus are all really important. And that's why uh, you'll find that NMR is used a lot in biology. Key feature of spins, the systems that have uh, non-zero spin is that they're gonna process a magnetic moment. And that when you put them in a magnetic field, they're gonna precess. This is similar to a top precessing in the Earth's uh, gravitational field. It's a consequence of conservation of angular momentum. The same way these particles have spin angular momentum, and so they precess in an external magnetic field. It turns out that the precession frequency is actually given by this equation here. It's one of the few equations I'll have. Omega is a frequency and it's proportional to the magnetic field. So the stronger the magnetic field, the faster the spins are precess. And you know the sense of the precession, as you can see in the figure here, can depend on whether the sign of this gamma is going to be clockwise or counterclockwise. The spins can precess in the field. And just to give you a sense of the, the scales that we're talking about, the energy, the frequency scales in a two Tesla or two and a half to 2.3 Tesla field, the a proton has a hundred megahertz uh, Larmor frequency or precession frequency. Now, the basic idea of magnetic resonance I was saying is what well, typically what we do is uh, we put the spins in a large external field. We typically think of that as being aligned along the, the Z direction. And for some of you may have seen, um, you know, in an electricity and magnetism class, the energy of the spins in the magnetic field is going to be the, the dot product of the, the magnetic moment and the electric and the magnetic field. And so that's just the energy of the system. And the spins will, pre, as I was saying before, will precess about the field at this characteristic frequency is omega zero. Now it turns out that all the spins are precessing with the same frequency but they're all at slightly different places on that circle. Uh, so the angle that they make with respect uh, to the, the, uh, on that, the position on the circle is actually going a little bit different, which means that the, they're slightly out of phase with each other is what we, how we think about that, which means that when I think about the net magnetization that's on the X direction or the Y direction perpendicular to, this, to the field, it ends up going to zero. But the, all the components that are aligned up with the field actually add up and you get a net magnetic moment. And that's essentially what you can see when I actually run an experiment. So that's the net magnetization of the sample. It's a sum of all the little components that you get from each individual spin. Now, NMR is usually done on a bulk sample. So we're talking about on the order of, you know, close to Avogadro's number, you know, maybe a few orders of magnitude smaller. So maybe 10 to the 20 spins or so is normally what you're looking to measure in an, a regular NMR experiment. And you've got all of these spins are, you know, some fraction of them that are pointing up. 
uh, and that's the that's what they look like in equilibrium. Essentially, it's a big mag magnet that's pointed along the direction of the magnetic field. It's kind of what you expect a compass to do, right? The way we run the experiment, this is the basic idea of an NMR experiment, is you apply a radio frequency field. You make, and the reason it's resonant is that the frequency of the field matches this Larmor precession frequency that I talked to you before, or told you before. So you make sure that the frequency, this omega term here, matches the energy, the Larmor uh, fre precession frequency. And you turn on the field for a certain period of time. Like here, it's just shown in this figure as tau. And then you record the signal. So what happens when you turn on these radio frequency fields is that the magnetization rotates from the Z axis. And let's say in this case, I'm applying a field along X then the magnetization will rotate to the Y axis. And you know, at some point it's gonna rotate into the, at a particular duration of this pulse tau, it's going to rotate into the, into the XY plane. And then when I, if I turn off my radio frequency field as I've done over here, what ends up happening is that the spins are gonna continue processing because it's big field is still there. And now you have a radio frequency coil that sees a time varying magnetization. And again, for those of you who've seen electricity and magnetism, you'll know that a time varying magnetic field induces an EMF in a coil, and that's what you pick up. And that's actually what we really go into the lab and measure. So we build these coils, we detect them, we detect the signal coming out of them. And the signal that you get, it looks like this. It's, it's, it's a free induction decay, it's what we call it. And Essentially, that's the essence of almost any NMR experiment. You wait, you you prepare the system, you apply some a radio frequency pulse, and you make a, and then you look at the time domain signal, which is what the three induction decay is. Later on, we'll post process the signal. We'll do things like take a Fourier transform to try and understand what the frequencies in the signal are, and that's really what the spectrum looks like when we talk about a spectrum. Now, it turns out that. You know, why is NMR such a popular technique? The spins are really sensitive to their local magnetic environments, which means that frequency that I told you about, that precession frequency actually changes based on the local magnetic environment of the spins. So there's something called a chemical shift. If you put the system in uh, the same proton in a slightly different chemical environment, it actually has a slightly different frequency. And so that's used to then, becoming a, to then become a chemical signature for telling you what that element is or where that proton is. So for example, this is a, a liquid state NMR spectrum of ethanol. And you can see that each of the hydrogens in here has a slightly different signature, like the A spins, which are the CH2 group, the B spins, which is the OH, and the C spins, which is the CH3 group. And so now you've got, you've actually been able to tell their the spins or the hydrogen, even though all the hydrogen themselves are identical, the nucleus is identical, they're probing a slightly different chemical environment because the, the bonds, the, the electrons in this, in, around these bond, are, bonds are, the, the, the concentration of electrons in the bonds is now changing. And so that's what we're sensitive to. The other thing that happens is that these are small magnets, they interact with each other. And so you have two types of interactions. One is called a J coupling, which is through the bonds. And the other is a spatial interaction through space. And because you can now use that information to encode what the, in, what the local geometry of those spins are. And that's become really important for chemistry when people do proteins, things like just chemical structure identification. And now, you know, for example, they can constrain distance to, between different elements of, an, of a complex protein. So this is like an amyloid, this is an amyloid fibril which essentially is one of the uh, structures that people think is important in, uh, in Alzheimer's. And NMR helps determine what the structure of, all, of this molecule is and not how the different groups arrange, not just in, within the bond, but how the overall molecule will fold on itself to create a three-dimensional structure. So all of this is information is something that you get from just this physical interaction between the spins and the fact that the spins are that this that interaction depends on the on the, the the geometry on the configuration of those spins in the system, so it's a really remarkable uh, tool for studying uh, for chemistry. And so this is where you know NMR started out in physics departments, went into chemistry departments, then went into biology departments. Now the other thing that you can do is saying, why do I have to make my magnetic field uniform? Why does every spin have to see the same magnetic field? Let's now make the magnetic field a function of position. But now that I know that the frequency is proportional to the field, if I make the magnetic field a function of position, maybe a linear of magnetic field, then my frequencies are going to be a, a function of position too. And now that allows me to encode spatial position into the spins. And that's essentially the basis of MR imaging, magnetic resonance imaging, which again is a huge field 
uh, entirely on its own. And you can encode all sorts of information into magnetic resonance images in this way. Uh, so just overall looking at, we've got the chemical sensitivity, We've got, we can do molecular structure determination. We can do imaging. So this is, now you can do things like, you can actually image the solid state structures to this is an image of a rabbit bone. You can do functional imaging, which is now people have used it to do things like brain mapping to understand cognitive behavior in animals and humans as well, because you can see the changes in blood flow. And because uh, since oxygenated and deoxygenated blood have different magnetic properties, you can actually see that difference based on when you, use when you engage part of your neurons for a cognitive task, you change the oxygen consumption that changes the local blood flow into that region. And you can pick that up in an MRI scan. And you do that very quickly. And that's what allows brain mapping studies to be done. So it's really important for cognitive neuroscience as well. And you can also use it for engineering, a whole variety of process control. This is actually the, uh, an image of, uh, of gas flowing through a coal bed reservoir because it becomes important for things like carbon dioxide sequestration. If you want to store carbon dioxide under the ground, which is one of the uh, things that people have thought about for remediating global warming, uh, you have to get a sense of actually what would happen if I put a lot of gas under pressure in a cold seam, for example. So this is just a range of applications that you can get with magnetic resonance. It's, you know, it's been a there are four Nobel Prizes have been awarded to date with magnetic resonance. This, the first was to Felix Bloch and Ed Purcell in 1952 for the actual observation of NMR and condensed matter. If you go back, actually, magnetic resonance and molecular beams, you know, Robbie's work was also very much related to uh, magnetic resonance as well. And then chemistry, two chemistry prizes and one in, in medicine as well. And it's like the range of applications is huge. Uh, one of the reasons is that NMR is really useful is that the spin degree of freedom of the nuclear spin is you know, essentially independent or isolated from many other degrees of freedom. So the molecules could be moving around, but that spin state stays remarkably well preserved. Sort of like you know, you're, you're, you're walking through a really crowded space, but you're able to keep your pro your, your prop the properties of your system really protected, even though think people are bouncing off you, people are moving around you all the time but you stay in the same state independent of what else is happening. That's kind of what we mean by, by this idea of separation from other degrees of freedom in the system. It also turns out that, you know, we've now, because as you can see, this is 90, 60 years ago, almost uh, 70 years ago, almost that NMR was first discovered. People have been developing techniques in this area for 60, 70 years. And there's a large variety of techniques that have been developed for spectroscopic applications. So when quantum information came along, NMR became a really good test bed for testing these ideas. Because really, as I said, said before, this qubit, which is a two-level system, and it has an, and if I put it in a magnet, if I think about the, what distinguishes these two bits is usually these some energy difference, typically uh, H bar, well, we delta E is H bar omega. And my two spin halves, my, the two states of my spin half particle, the spin up and the spin down state are also separated by H bar omega. And so that's a fixed energy given. And in fact, this omega is the Larmor frequency of the spin that we had before. So there's a nice mapping between these two systems. So when people started looking at quantum information and quantum computing, using NMR as a test bed was almost the first, one of the first things you would try. So many of the quantum algorithms uh, things like Shor's algorithm, which is a factoring of, quant of, no of number of prime numbers, a factoring of numbers into primes, was uh, was done on NMR quantum computers. So you know we factored fifth. We didn't. I, uh, Ike Chuang and this group at IBM uh, factored fifteen into three times five, but they had a really complicated molecule that they had to use to do that factoring experiment. Now the key the distinction, as you know, between uh, a quantum system and a classical system, quantum bit and a classical bit, is that I can be in superposition states now in the classical, in the quantum bit. The classical bit can only be in the zero or one state. And here, uh, an arbitrary quantum state can be in a linear superposition of the zero states and, uh, and one state. And the, we can get to more complex quantum states. So I don't just have one qubit. I can have large numbers of qubits. I can create things like what are called cat states, which is goes back to Schrodinger's cat's uh, thought experiment, where what would happen if, you know, you 
could you create a super macroscopic superposition of things that are very dis, of macroscopically distinct? So in his case, a cat being alive or dead. Uh, here, you know, all the spins being up or all the spin and all the spins being down. And in at least in terms of the spins, there's nothing in quantum mechanics that that we know of so far that says you cannot do this independent of the number of particles n that I would have in the system at this point in time. I always put that caveat because you never know what you're going to learn next. We, you know, we've only demonstrated up to a certain number of particles, but the question is, is there a fundamental limit? And that's something we don't know about right now. So just to give you a little bit more of a sense of how an NMR system could like this could be mapped onto, let's say, a two-qubit system. Uh, here I write what's called the Hamiltonian, which tells you what the energy of the system is. See, I have two spins, and I call them I and S and each of them has their own Lama frequency and have the two spins interact. So you can think about as each, the four, the spins can be, there are four different states that I can have. This both spins being up, pointing up, one spin up, one spin down, both spins down, or once the other spin down and one spin up. And these lines that I've shown here are correspond to flipping one of the spins. And that's really the, the transition that you measured in an NMR experiment. So if I took the spectrum, from this molecule, I would get four lines, and each of these of these lines, this energy level transition corresponds to one spectral line, corresponds to when one distinct energy that I have in the system. So four transitions, four lines here, and that's what we measure in the NMR experiment. If I just ran a simple NMR experiment on this, and this would map onto a two qubit system. Again, I could think about this as zero, 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 one, 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 and one, zero. And by applying pulses, I could transform between different qubit states in the system. So what we would do, for example, in this case, you could do an inversion pulse. You want to flip one of the spins. And so here, what we want to do is we only want to flip the second spin. So we're flipping down to up, down to up in this case. Uh, and so you, when you do that, you just flip both of the, in, invert both of these transitions. When that happens. Sorry to interrupt, Seker. Someone yep. was asking in the chat what was J on the previous equation. Okay, um, great. So J is the strength of the coupling. I told you that the two spins can interact with each other. They're both magnetic moments. And so we use J to represent the, the interaction strength between these two spins as they see through a bond. It's called a J coupling. Because I don't know, hopefully that answers your question. It's, it's characterized as a strength of interaction between the two spins. And so it's one of the things that becomes really important when you want to think about creating, a, 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 operating on multiple qubits is that you need a way to, for the qubits to interact. And so here that J term, the interaction between spins or interaction between qubits is what allows you to ultimately make, do things like more complex two qubit quantum gate, two qubit gates. All right, let me just check where we are in time. All right, we're doing okay. Uh, we can also do just a, a pi over two on one of the transitions and that actually will, again, you can see how the, and that will change only one of them, for example. So there's a variety of things that you can do that are qubit selective. And this is kind of the simplest way in which you can use NMR by applying these pulses to do selective transformations that of the spin states or the qubit states in this case to implement whatever, uh, whatever set of gates that you want to apply, which is hopefully is then part of some algorithm that you're building up towards. So you take the algorithm, you break it down into gates, and then each of those gates gets further resolved into a sequence of pulses that you're applying to the system in, in, in the experiment. So great, you know, you could, we could do all of this stuff at, you know, the people showed things like error correction, factoring, a whole variety of algorithms back in the late 90s to the early 2000s. And then why didn't we keep going? Is, a good, is almost a question one would ask. And that comes back to this question of energy scales. You know, one of the requirements of a quantum computer is that you need to start, be able to start out in a well-defined state. That usually requires that, you know, the, the, so when I look at a qubit, I need to know, are you in the zero state or the one state? And normally what we do is to, to enable that is we always cool the qubit down and say, if I look at an, a qubit at any instant of time, it must be in the ground state because, and that means that it's the energy difference, the 
the, the thermal fluctuations that would take it to the next excited state, the, the one state, are too small. That just random thermal fluctuations are, cannot take you from a zero state to a one state. And so in order to understand what causes that, we have to look at what's the energy of my system and what's the energy of the thermal fluctuations that are present. So if I think about a proton and, and, uh, and, and a Mars system, proton at seven Tesla, it corresponds to a Lamar frequency of 300 megahertz, which is about 1.2 microelectron volts. The characteristic thermal energy at 300 Kelvin is, corresponds to a frequency of six terahertz or 25 millielectron volts. So you can see this 25 milli MeV is much larger than the 1.2 micro EV, which then she says the thermal fluctuations are much larger than the energy required to flip my zero to a one or the one to a zero. So what ends up happening is that the system is continuously being flipped back and forth from zero to one and one to zero by thermal fluctuations. And then on average, there's almost an equal number of spins pointing up and pointing down. It's not, energy, it's not that much more energetically favorable to be pointing up along the field. If I think about an electron, it has a much larger magnetic moment. So if I go to at, the, at 0.34 Tesla, it's about 10 gigahertz, 40 microelectron volts. At 3.4 Tesla, it goes to about 100 gigahertz, which is 400 micro EV. Now, if I cool that system down to three Kelvin, I've got the, at three Kelvin, the thermal fluctuations are about 60 gigahertz or 250 micro EV. And you can now see that for this is the first time, my electron spin at 3.4 Tesla has a larger energy gap than the thermal average thermal fluctuations at three Kelvin. Now, this is kind of the, this is the, almost the main reason why, in you know, even though we're using superconducting qubits, for example, if you think about what Google and IBM are doing, they've got these superconducting qubits. You need to cool down to about you know a, a few Kelvin to get the system to be superconducting. But to really get into the regime where h bar omega is much larger than kbt, h bar omega being the qubit energy and kbt being the thermal energy, you have to cool down to a few tens of millikelvin. And that what that's what really improves the properties of your qubit in a way. Now the liquid state NMR, we're operating at room temperature. And so we're always in this regime where h bar omega is very small compared to kbt. And that makes it really, really hard to develop qubits in liquid state NMR. You can, you can try to look at those few spins that are, have, that are in the right state, but that makes it very inefficient to scale your system up in size. And it, the second, so that's one of the key reasons why liquid state NMR cannot be made uh, more scalable to large numbers of qubits. The second factor that comes in is chemistry. Uh, the range of, of different frequencies that we get, which is what we need to address a spin, because to be a qubit, I need to actually go in and look at spin A and say, I want to flip U, or spin C, and I would say, I want to flip U, or I want to control U, and I need to be able to control them independently. That becomes harder and harder to do if I suddenly put a thousand spins, and I only have a hundred hertz in which I could have spread all of those thousand transitions, or now two to the thousand transitions maybe, that I, I want to implement. The It becomes really hard to then be, make sure that I can only hit one spin at one, qubit at a time. And so uh, limiting your dressing by chemistry is the other reason why NMR, because it's really hard to really just have an NMR only quantum computer. And this is one of the reasons why I say NMR is not, NMR is really useful, it's really important, but it's not necessarily going to be a great qubit on its own. Even if I, let's say, went into the solid state and dealt with, you know, and tried to overcome those problems, limitations of chemistry become a big challenge. In, uh, in trying to do NMR only. But if I, one of the things that we do look, think about is think about the electron spin. So the electron spin is also has fairly long coherence times. And so a lot of the work we do in my group right now is actually thinking about, can we create hybrid electron nuclear systems where I can use the good properties of the nuclear spin when I want it, but not use the bad properties when I don't want it. So that's where the, the idea of a hybrid qubit comes in. So what's good about a nuclear spin? The good thing about a nuclear spin is, as I was saying, it, it doesn't, it's less sensitive to what else is happening around it, which means it's great as something like a memory device. So I want to store something in there and then leave it. It's a great memory. But if I actually want to do an operation, it's, it takes, it's very slow. To, uh, to actually change, flip it from up to down or do anything else with it. So it's not a great actually computational qubit. 
So I don't really want to operate with it. It also is really hard to read out because the same reason that makes it really uh, have a really long lifetime means that it's really slow to get information in and out of that system, which means I don't want to, again, use it to read out. So what I want is an ancillary system where I'm doing all of my operate, gate operations and my readout on this other system. For my case, I think about that as the electron spin. But then when I, when I want to store information for a little while, I move that onto the nuclear spin for a bit, store it there, and then when I'm ready to use it again, move it back to the electron spin and then do the next set of processing or readout that I would want to do. So the things that we think about right now in terms of moving forward are, uh, again, this just recapitulates some of the things I was saying before that this very weakly polarized means that there's almost an equal number of spins being up and down that, and that it becomes the number of spins in a given state declines as you go, uh, exponentially as you go up with the number of spins. So certain things, reason why is liquid standard MR doesn't work really well for a scalable system. This is an example of what, of what we can do when you use an electron spin. So if I think about an electron spin having much larger magnetic moment, I can now use that much larger magnetic moment both to prepare the spins in a well-defined state as well as to read out the spins. So one of the things that people do with nuclear with electron spins is what we call hyperpolarizing the nuclear spin. So we make the, the population difference for the nuclear spins look similar to what it is for the electron spin. So it looks like the nuclear spin has a much larger effective magnetic moment. And the idea here is you just drive an electron, uh, a system that has both electrons and nuclear spins together, uh, and you drive them at the electron spin frequencies. And so an example here is that say H bar omega E, which is electron frequencies is large compared to KBT. So the electron spins are in that ground state, but the left right where there's an equally almost, it's almost equally likely for the, the nuclear spin to be up or down. So this is what I'm indicating with the different colors here. Now, if I drive the electron spin, that drive the electron spins up, they're gonna flip up and come back down, the up and down here and up and down here. And it turns out that if you have this, there's a certain probability for the electron spins to, uh, for the electron nuclear system to flip from the up down to the down up state. Over time, the system will actually slowly move into this pro into this state here, and then all of the spins that were down here move up here, move into this state. And eventually, now both your electrons and your nuclei are all in a well defined state, the down up state. Okay the down for the electrons and the up for the nuclei, which means you've essentially cooled, uh, it looks like you've cooled the nuclear spins down. And that turns out to be really important, both from a quantum information processing perspective, but it's being used now in my biomedical applications as well. So it's an interesting synergy that what, while NMR started out with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, has we, we took all these tools that were developed for, for chemistry and uh, in some ways biology and applied them to quantum information processing. We can now also take tools from quantum information processing and apply them back to things like biology and chemistry. And so there, uh, this idea of DNP or dynamic nuclear polarization has been used to, has uh, now has a few commercial products, a product from Oxford, GE and Brooker, which uh, help improve the NMR signal for just for people who are doing NMR signal, for, uh, NMR spectroscopy or imaging in some ways. What we try to do is we're thinking about three different distinct types of physical systems. We use hybrid electron nuclear systems. This is some experiments that we did. I'm not gonna go into them in detail here. I just wanna give you a feel for what we do is we look at, this is an uh, irradiated malonic acid, it's an organic crystal. And we can take a, electron, a hybrid electron nuclear system and control the dynamics really coherently in the system on a much faster time scale than you could with just the NMR system alone, but still utilizing the, and the properties of the nuclear spins when I cared about using them. The other systems that's, that's of interest to us is things like the solid state defect systems, the most common ones, most, a lot of people study NV centers, nitrogen vacancy center. I'm interested also in the P1 center, which is the uh, a P1 center is one where you just substitute a nitrogen for one of the carbon atoms, and it's a spin half system. It has a very long coherence time. The downside of it is it's not optically addressable. The, if you take one of those and you move a vacancy right adjacent to it, it becomes a nitrogen vacancy center. And those have become really popular as quantum sensors, as well as ways in which you can develop do quantum simulations. And uh, again, you're there, you're dealing with both nitrogen nuclei as well as uh, carbon nuclei. And it's important to be able to control those systems as well when you're developed, when you're looking at these defect systems. 
And finally, the other system that I, I think about a lot is silicon uh, quantum processes. And here I think about donor systems where here the phosphorus donor electrons and nucleus in uh, silicon, where the phosphorus 31 is 100% abundant spin half system and it has incredibly long coherence times. And here the electron spin also has really long coherence times, all getting reaching up almost to a second for the electron spin in uh, isotopically enriched silicon 28. The nice thing about things like silicon is that you can actually, in addition to doing uh, inductive readout, which is the type of readout I measure where you detect the magnetic moment directly, you can do a spin to charge conversion and actually detect, make a device that reads out the electron, the state of the spin by a charge measurement. And that becomes really, really useful when you want, make, want to make a device and essentially put everything onto a single chip. And you think about a future technology, if you can integrate everything onto one chip, uh, it's more effective to become a practical device in the future. So just want to wrap up here for the first part and just say, you know, this work is done oh, not by me, but by students and grad students, postdocs and undergrads here. And I'm going to thank you. Uh, Shekhar, could I ask a question, please? Sure, please do. Uh, so when you have this hybrid uh, electron nuclear systems, yep. uh, isn't there some uh, so criterion for the, the separation, spatial separation, of the two. I mean, you can't have it at uh, all sort of the distances. It has to be within certain specific distances, isn't it? So it depends on what type of hybrid you're looking at. So if I think about an electron nuclear hybrid system, often they're going to be in largely, there's a strong overlap between the electron and the nuclear. The nuclear spins are going to be essentially in the, you know, are, in, for example, the donor electron, let me give you a practical example, the donor electron and silicon, the, the phosphorus donor uh, is actually at the si same site uh, as the, is essentially the origin of that electronic wave function too. So they are they occupy the same spatial location. What they what the their energy scales are different, and so there there needs you're right in the sense that there needs to be some some way in which I can separate and have it some distinguishability between those two uh, hybrid qubits in a different architecture. Uh, let's say I'm thinking about uh, a superconducting qubit, it might be that they have to be in a spatial, diff a spatially different locations, or maybe there, if I want to think about a coupling, a spin a level, maybe a two level fluctuator that's present within the, inside the circuit, that might be, they might, act, they might be able to coexist spatially as well, but it depends on what type of hybrid uh, encoding you're thinking about. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, I'm also thinking of, say, mole molecular complexes. Um, so where you have these electrons on, on metal atoms and, and then you have all the ligands that are attached to that covalently. So, right. so in that case, uh, I mean, uh, I, I'm sure you, you must be aware of this work. Uh, there has to be uh, this uh, sort of a diffusion, uh, this radius with, uh, there is some criteria which has to be met so that the electrons can be initialized and have a reasonably good coherence time because otherwise they uh, they interact with these neighboring absolutely uh, right yeah so the same thing happens in something like silicon the the silicon system I was looking at so if I had silicon twenty nine is which is about which is a spin isotope of silicon it's about four it's about five percent abundant uh, the quality of this phosphor stoped uh, silicon qubit actually is is okay if we do natural silicon, which has about 5% abundance spin half uh, new silicon 29 nuclei. But if I remove all of those silicon 29 and re replace it with uh, silicon 28, which has no spin, which is spin zero, all of a sudden the isolation that I have of that qubit, which I think is what you're mentioning earlier in terms of that ligand okay. in the molecular system, the isolation of that yes. qubit becomes much better and the coherence times get much longer. So you're right that there is a way in which you've got to, uh, whether it's spatially or in some ways energetically, isolate that system so that it stays uh, a well-defined qubit space, if you will. So, so are, are you able? Sorry, uh, two things have said at the same time. I didn't hear that. No, no, I, I was just saying that there is um, um, a question in the chat uh -huh. um, that um, has to do with uh, actually COVID-related diagnosis. Uh, they say currently pulse oximeters are used to measure oxygen percentage for COVID. Um, since you said that changing oxygen can be discovered using nuclear magnetic resonance, can we create devices to scan 
or monitor oxygen levels like we have so, now temperature scans yeah uh i mean a, the pulse oximeter does that and it does it optically much more cheaply than you would do it with a magnetic resonance sensor so yes be i mean so there are optical it's not that you can't do it with magnetic resonance it just seems like it's a, it's a more expensive and less efficient way of doing it there are people typically use electron spin resonance to do what's called tissue oximetry and there is uh, work where in looking at things like in, within tumors how how well oxygenated is tissue uh, is done with electron spin resonance uh, the challenge with electron spins is that is, is that free unpaired electron spins are free radicals and so they are usually toxic. So you have to be careful on how you use them in bio biomedical systems. Just curious to follow up on this, uh, for this uh, electron spin resonance imaging, yeah. do they like inject the free rail or how, how do Actually, they, so what they, they try to do, there? they try to encapsulate them within a, a material which is then permeable to blood. So the, the electron spins are fixed to a scaffold, but it's a permeable scaffold. So the, the oxygen, the, the, the fluids can, the plasma can flow through. And so you can still monitor the local oxygen concentration, but the, the free radical itself is not allowed to then disperse and go out. So you essentially have a little implant that you put in there and then you can take it out later on when you don't need it anymore. They're shy today, Saker. Come on, That's people. Okay. And you know, this is I was told that they could you could ask me questions about, you know, background, history, not just about the science too. So uh, yeah, so actually could you tell us a little bit about your uh, career path? I, I've got a very strange career path or relatively strange career path. So uh, I start out, it's interesting. I you know, I I was uh, I was born and largely brought up in India, and I was so I was had to take this huge entrance exam uh, at uh, in twelfth grade to get into the Indian Institute of Technology, and I you know did fairly well in the exam, and I wanted to do engineering physics, but it was a brand new field at the time in uh, in IIT, and everyone convinced me like, why do you want to do engineering physics? It's like it's you know it's a brand it's the first year it's being offered, you shouldn't do it. And I was like, I want to do it. And, then I had all this pressure put on me and eventually I became an electrical engineer because that's was what was popular. And they said, oh, you should do electrical engineering. So I did electrical engineering and you know, I was kind of burnt out for a while. My first two years, my grades were like, I was in the, definitely in the bottom half of the class. Uh, and then somewhere around year three, things started to get more interesting. I just, we got more into the subject matter that I cared about. I got better at it. And I did my senior thesis actually in uh, signal processing and uh, looking at imagery construction and MRI and things like ultra fast MRI, which is what's used for brain mapping right now. Uh, and I applied to grad school in biomedical engineering to do, uh, again, more medical imaging. And I thought I was biomedical engineering was gonna save the world because I was gonna use my engineering skills to do something usefully. So I went to University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for a master's project first. And uh, I was working in single photon tomography and that was my, my master's project I was doing image reconstruction for single photon tomography. And my project was incorporating all the physical, you know, when you, in single photon tomography, what you do is you give someone a radionuclide into the body. And then you, you look at the gamma rays that are emitted by that. And from that emitted gamma rays, you try to reconstruct what the source distribution was. And my job was putting, you know, there were a variety of algorithms to compensate for things like physical effects, like scatter and attenuation. And I had to put that into the image reconstruction code and make it fast. And actually it turned out GE was very interested in my in project. So I was funded by GE to actually implement this, these algorithms on the array processors at the time that they were using in their instruments. So they sent me to a computing, uh, to one of the, 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 the companies that they worked with so that I could optimize my code. I was thinking about single instructions of, of, of making things as fast as possible. So I did spend two years of my life doing this. And then uh, the manager at GE changed and uh, essentially the project was dropped. And I said, you know, I've, I've improved the technology. It was so great. I spent two years of my life doing this and uh, it's not working. And you know, somebody decided, some, the manager changed us and he said, oh yeah, that was interesting. We don't need to do anything. 
So then I was like, why? Yeah, you know, so it's really frustrating at that point in time. So I applied for PhD programs. I decided I want to do something more fundamental. And so just because I felt the science would be less, very, my contribution to science would change less with time. And so I applied and I got to MIT. I was, again, primarily in radiological sciences, starting out thinking I was doing bi biomedical imaging, but I wanted to do something more basic. I also did a degree in uh, technology policy by, at the, while I was at MIT, because I had this question of like, why did they want to not do it? Why did they not follow up with this technology? And I realized they had monopoly power, right? They own 95, 98% of the market. They had no incentive to innovate. They were curious to know, to make sure they were on top of what was happening so that they wouldn't be scooped, but they were not actually gonna put the money into upgrading their product because there was no, no real value to them uh, in terms of doing that, which, and you know, in things like technology, they're specifically computational technology. The work I did was obsolete within three years or two years even because computers changed. And the things I had to do at that point in time were not relevant a few years later. So anyhow, I was going to do uh, something more fundamental. I decided I was gonna be a theorist. I started work with somebody in chemistry and I worked with them for a year on very basic things like how do you couple energy across different energy, uh, across different scales. So at that time we were interested in cytochrome oxidase, cytochrome C oxidase, and into photosynthetic pathways and things like okay, you how does an optical reaction eventually the a chain of optical uh, uh, you you start with an optical excitation, but then it cascades down through multiple energy scales, and how does that happen efficiently? So I started looking at this problem and then my advisor left MIT and I was like, I didn't want to leave. So I looked around for a different project and I came up with a project on doing MRI scans. On, but this was looking at bone, looking at salty and MR of bone. We're trying to understand, can we do, can you do in vivo NMR of bone? And normally salty NMR is done with very high RF power. So most people don't think of doing NMR with on humans or animals with uh, on, when you look at the solid. Uh, we just say there's no signal from the solid. There's a ton of signal, it's just hard to detect. But I ended up coming and doing a project on NMR spectroscopy of bone, trying to distinguish between uh, protonated phosphates and non-protonated phosphates, which essentially turns out that old, older bone has protonated phosphate, newly deposited bone has, uh, uh, sorry, older bone has non-protonated phosphates, newly deposited bone has protonated phosphates, HPO4 groups. And if you can distinguish the two, you have a, a marker for bone turnover and fracture healing and things like that. So it's important for osteoporosis, important for fracture healing. So I came up with a technique to, to do that. To, well, while I was doing that, I was fascinated by studying the solitary NMR and all these questions about what determines the coherence time of spins in the solid became fascinating to me. And I was like, and I got stuck on this question in my head during my PhD. It wasn't central to what I was doing, but I had to understand it a little bit to solve this other problem. So that's, I did that. I moved on from it. I then did a postdoc in biomedical imaging. I was doing imaging of bone, first of all. Then I moved to using, developing different contrast materials for, for uh, imaging, brain imaging and MR. You know, I did gas phase imaging, things like, how do you study porous media? Uh, I did a variety of other MR scans, but this question always came back to like the physics that I was really curious about was about the fundamental spin physics. So I was actually finishing my third, second postdoc and wondering what to do. I applied for faculty positions and, you know, I was applying as a biomedical engineer and I was not, there was no biomedical problem that really captured my attention that I wanted to solve. All I wanted to do was develop spin techniques that could be used by others. And so I was having a chat with uh, somebody who was on my committee, David Corey, and he said, listen, we're starting NMR, we're doing NMR quantum computing. Do you want to join my group? I said, I know nothing about it. He said, neither do we. Let's get started. And I said, sure. And it was a perfect match because now it was like the problems I was interested in that had sort of my innate curiosity had driven me sort of matched with what I was actually had to do every day. And that was fascinating. I was like, all right, I can just go ahead and do this now. And so I joined his group and... Uh, it was fascinating because all I, all I, I'd learned all these things but in a completely different language, but then I had to do the translation into this new language of quantum information processing and then move forward with it. And that sort of then set me on the path to where I am now. I mean, I'm in a physics department. I don't have any physics degrees. Uh, I teach physics, I'm a professor of physics, but, uh, and I do, what I do is physics, but I got here a little roundabout route, I would say.
That's really impressive. Thank you for sharing. I don't know if it's impressive. I think it's just stubborn. I think it's one of those, <laughs> and this is what I usually tell people. It's like, you know, people, you know, I get a lot of people ask me like, how do you know what you want to do? I said, I never knew really. I just like, this seems interesting now I'm going to try it. But it's maybe at some point, if it's unsatisfying, you also are willing to change. And even if you have to take a step back to learn something new, it's worth it because your life, your career extends over a much longer time scale. And it's one of those things that's fascinated me. When I was in grad school, I, was, I used to do tutoring and I would meet people who are going back to med school in their mid forties. And these were people like they had left, they had got a degree in something and non-science degree typically and undergraduate. They had gone off and had families. And then they came back and said, you know, I want to, I'm, I want to go and become a doctor. And I go, go, wow, that's a commitment. You know, you're going to go into four, five, four years of grad, med school. Then you're going to go and do your residency and internships and everything else. It's like, and they're like, no, but this is what, think about everything else that I have to do. Right. I mean, it's about the, it's the life that you have to live that that's really important. And the fact that they were able to willing to just go back and just say, you know, teach me, teach me the freshman physics, teach me high school physics in some cases so that I can go back and I'm willing to invest the time now so that in two to three years, I can be doing what I want to do and what I really care about. And that I found to be, you know, to be really inspirational in a way. And that sort of encouraged me to say, yeah, you don't know it, but if that's what you want to do, you know, it's fine. It's a year of your life, but you're talking about a 40, 50 year old career and you know, sometimes it's not just about the career, it's about your engagement, even if it's a shorter period of time, even if it's 10 years or five years, you're talking about the intellectual engagement that you would have, that's the desire and the passion that's gonna come up with it. And if you find something that matches what you wanna do, it's just, you're so much more excited getting up in the morning and going into work than when you're having to do something that someone else is telling you to do and you don't really care about doing it. So. You know, don't, it's not to say don't do things that are hard. I think you have to be willing to do things that are hard, but uh, and everything looks exciting when you start and everything looks hard when you get into the details. But if you go through the details and it's still not exciting, and then it's time to rethink. You know, if you give it the honest effort for some period of time and it's still not working, you gotta say, okay, what is it that really excites me? So on, on this note of uh, excitement, yeah. um, looking into the future, yeah. what is it that excites you the most? So for me, science-wise, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, science-wise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I've, so the questions that actually, what's interesting is that the basic questions that interested me when I, during my PhD are still the questions that drive me now. So some of those are things like, uh, you know, we understand things like the second law of thermodynamics. We, we think we understand things like the second law of thermodynamics. We think we understand, you know, the arrow of time. And, uh, but then when we ask and ask, push the questions a little bit deeper and say, okay, can we really show this? And what does it mean for a system to be at thermal equilibrium or equilibrium? And especially when I then add this in the context of quantum mechanics, which is one of the things that was interesting to me is like, when I think about large numbers of quantum systems interacting and they say, we, we sort of often will do a hand waving that says, well, the system starts to looking classical along there, but exactly how, what is that process that happens? And, uh, you know, at some point we have, we should be able to explain irrespective of the size of the system we're looking at, what, what are the sequence of events that happen that take our model of the universe that we have now, let's say it's quantum mechanics, that then results in everything that we see and interact and experience and, and measure around us. So as we push those boundaries further, like, and for me that places things like uh, the physics of large systems, like the, 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 the interface between the microscopic world and the macroscopic world in some ways. And so how, does, how can I explain what's happening around me from these fundamental principles? If I want to be honest with the details as I, as I go, as I change the scale, I'm not willing to just hand wave those details away. I want to be systematically change, see what happens as I go from one scale to the other.
And so I think that's a realm of quantum simulation. And I think, you know, there's phenomenal stuff happening with quantum simulation these days. And I think it's only going to get better. I don't want to be, you know, hogging the questions. So students, please uh, ask some questions. Oh, there is a question in the chat. Um, <coughs> is there an entanglement process in the two qubit molecule NMR example given? Uh Yes, there is an, uh, a way to do, I have to be careful about how I answer that question in a way, because people have, it, it depends on how, if it looks like the system is entangled. So the gates that we do is something called the pound overhauser gate or the, the we selectively uh, flip one spin based on whether the other spin is up or down creates entanglement effectively, or it looks like entanglement in two spins. The challenge, the reason I'm giving you a caveat is because uh, people show that li in liquid state NMR, in, in, if you really push the limits again, uh, and I try to take out all the, 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 the full description of the experiment, there is no entanglement in liquid state NMR because you're dealing with such a large number of spins and you're dealing with such a large statistical, statistical mixture that you can't provably show that the system was entangled. And so it looks, you know, from the perspective of, uh, an experiment, the experiment that we did is no different and you wouldn't be able to ex uh, experimentally tell the difference between this and the entanglement that we measure here and other forms of entanglement that you'd measure in, a, in an isolated qubit. There is, a, because it's an ensemble measurement over a large number of spins, you can say you provably showed entanglement. So that's just, it's a little bit of a, a, a it's, it's a answer is yes, but with, a, with an asterisk next to it. Um, so if you are able to address single molecule level, um, then it's then you can say it's uh, entangled. Um, if you could do a single spin detection, let's say I do the single exper same experiment, but I could detect a single spin. Yes, it would be okay. entangled. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Come on, you must be curious. So I I, I, I have a question. Yeah. In your opinion, mm -hmm. do you think there might be any way that even simple quantum properties might be harnessed by nature? What do you mean by that? I guess I, I think, you know, on some thoughts I would say, I would say absolutely. I mean, I think quantum properties are always being harvested by nature because, you know, the nature of our, our all chemical reactions, selection pathways and everything depends on some ways fundamentally on uh, quantum properties. Now, if you're asking, uh, which I think is what you're asking, things like do coherent states or suppositions, entangled states potentially play a role in things like improving quantum efficiency, the efficiency of a chemical pathway or something like that. Uh, I think it's an interesting idea. I think the challenge of course is providing sufficient protection to make sure that, the coherent, that on the timescales, relevant timescales, that this supposition state or entangled state is actually able to survive. Anna, what do you think? We need we need at least one question for, from a freshman. What do you think? Yes, definitely. Okay. Hi, I'm a freshman. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Thank you. That was really good. So I'm curious, what are some of the biggest, like what are some of the biggest things that we might be able to do, like different kinds of what might be detected on imaging or what might be done with computers based on the stuff you're talking about. What do you mean by, when you say biggest, do you mean in size? I mean, like the most, the most significant things. 
Uh, that you know the the challenge with significance is in the eye of the beholder often. So, but magnetic resonance, if you think about you know sensing and making measurements with magnetic resonance, uh, for example, the NV center has been used to detect uh, the firing of a single neuron and the electrical and the magnetic fields that you can see from a single neuron. It's also uh, you know, things like NMR is being used to study, uh, search for dark matter, signatures of dark matter detection in the universe. So on one hand, those are both, yeah, one is very applied and biological, one's very fundamental. What is the nature of the universe we live in? I think it has, a, that's the beauty of NMR for me is that it has a role to play in both these very, very fundamental questions that may be very geeky physicists only care about. But I think everyone who's curious on some level, like what is this, what is, the nature of the universe that we live in, as well as very practical questions such as, you know, do you have a ligament? Do you have ligament damage when you twist your knee? You're still going to go for an MRI scan. And that same technology is the ability to do both things. And so that's kind of a cool thing for me. And so I think the significance question really cares about what are the important questions of the day. And so for example, you could say COVID, does NMR have a role to play in identify and related to COVID? And I would say people are using NMR techno techniques to study the structures and biolic and uh, the protein structures uh, of that of molecules that might be relevant to COVID transmission. So yes, yeah, it is. It's it has a role to play. Is it the only thing? No. That's really cool. Thank you so much. That's awesome. You're welcome. And I'm not sure I'm happy. I think we need a second question from a freshman. What do you think? Yeah, at least it would be perfect if we got even two more. Yes, I agree. Um, I I thought your presentation was really good. So thank you to like, like scientific wise. I feel like I understood everything. Well, not to my fullest extent. So like, I don't have any questions there. I just have a question more about like, your career path I guess because I feel like I'm the person who likes everything and can't commit myself to everything mm -hmm. and people are like oh you have time to think but at the same time like I think students like me are really pressured to like commit to something and then like we might not even like it like once yeah. we get into the details so what would be your, your advice on that especially since like education is very expensive these days yep. and we're worried about like like, oh, if we do switch, am I going to be able to afford it? So what would you say yeah. to that? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you. And, you know, thank you for your comments on the on the presentation. The, you know, I tell, I talk to students about this all the time here. And, uh, you know, FOMO is a big deal too. In addition to the cost issue, there's also fear of missing out. And, you know, so like if I choose this, I'm not going to be able to do this. And, you know, and how do I know what my passion is? And because we tell people to follow their passion and people go, often will say, I don't know what my passion is. So uh, my view is that you have to, especially as an undergraduate, you, it's worth exploring a few different things but have, having a limited number. And when you explore, making sure you don't just explore superficially, you got to go in a little bit of detail. This is where everything looks fascinating as I was saying on the outside, and then you get into it and you think about what am I really gonna do on a day-to-day -day basis? What do the details look like? That's really worth thinking about and getting some experience with before you sort of say, do I like this or do I not like this? Am I happy? Uh, Beyond that, I think you do have to make a leap in a way of saying, okay, what, what do I think? There's a gut instinct that comes in. There's so many careers, there's so many different possible paths. There's no way you can see really try everything. And uh, so if you wanna have experience before you can commit, that's never gonna happen. And also the other thing that's gonna happen is that the world is gonna change. So the world is changing faster and faster than it ever has. So that the capabilities that we had two to three years ago are not what, you know, or the skills that we needed two to three years ago are not necessarily the skills that we need now. So we think about it often is, can you think about the critical thinking? Can you do problem solving generically? Are, uh, how can you, how do I, how good are you at solving problems, arbitrary types of problems? How good are you at breaking, uh, you know, using computational tools or mathematical models or something like that. That's something that can, is going to be consistent even if the problems change or your technology changes. And focusing on some of those things becomes really important to being a creative thinker, even if the problems change and the technology changes, I think. So those are the things that I ask people to think about. 
And I think ultimately it's like everything that we do, it's a leap into the future, right? We trust and we hope we land safely. And we, there are, I would say there are some people who are happy doing anything. And there are some people who are unhappy doing everything. And there's the choice that you make. And it's not so much about what it is that you do, it's how you approach it. So if you make the choice to say, you know, this is an exploration, this is an adventure, this is going to be fun. Some of, not everything's going to be perfect, but a lot of it will be. You end up having a good time. Uh, if you go into it sort of saying, what's in, where, what am I going to get out of it? Often you're disappointed. And I think there's a, there's an element where you, how you approach it actually changes your experience of it. Thank you very much. That was very inspirational. <laughs> I feel a lot more calm, I guess. <laughs> yeah. You know, we don't be afraid to make mistakes. I think, you know, mistakes happen. That's the only way we learn. Uh, but we recover from them. And the thing is, even what do I call a mistake? It's just, yeah, I, I did something. It didn't quite work out. But that's, you know, it's, I've become a different person. I've learned a lot more from whatever, you know, didn't work out too. So, yeah, I would say if you don't make mistakes, you're not trying, right? Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So who's gonna be the third brave undergrad to ask a question? No. <laughs> Go Bruins, come on. <laughs> or anyone else who has a question. <laughs> Another question. Let's see. Go for it, Juliana. Let me try and figure out which one. So let me see. How do you like what is it that how do you get the watch McCollard? Like the How do you get the, what do you find is helpful to get to have the energy and the focus to do your best work every day, even the days that might be a bit harder? Oh, uh, that's hard. Um, I, uh, what I've found, uh, it's, I started meditating, really. That's, uh, I have you know, is good. it was, it used to be easier. I will say the world has become harder to focus on because there's so many devices, you know, what's fascinating is like when I was studying, I used to go to the library and I'd have to photocopy every paper I read. And that was, it took time and energy to do that. And I freezing to, up or maybe my thing. Yeah. Am I freezing for anyone else? No. Okay. Here you're back. Okay, so the so it would you know the, the rate of information flow was much slower earlier, and so I could able I was able to sort of take time. Nowadays, you know, there are hundred papers published in my field every day, and there's multiple devices, and I'm just overwhelmed. And part of it really is then just saying, okay, I can't keep up with everything, and what am I being selective and intentional about choosing what it is that matters. Uh, so, and I think that's where I had to, I went, you know, I would essentially was bouncing off everything and not getting anything done, which for a long time before I sort of said, all right, what's going to help me? And I found meditation helps and it's just helps me sort of connect back and always ask myself what is important and where am I spending my time? I don't know if that helps, but that's, it's sort of, you know, a question that I ask myself regularly. Yeah. That's really good. Thank you. Yeah. 
Well, um, if there are no more questions, um, let's give a round of applause to Becker for a wonderful talk and a fascinating uh, life story. <laughs> Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, thank you everyone for coming again. And we hope to see you again next week. And uh, oh boy, I forgot what right. we're talking about next week. Next week, let me see. Photons, maybe? No, it's trapped ions. Oh, oh. it's trapped ions. Yes. Oh. All right. Um, All right. Seeker, thank you very, very much. Okay. We really appreciate right. you. Bye. Bye, bye everyone. Bye, bye. Okay. Say bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Say bye. bye. bye.